Okay, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. And uh, my subject is not related to supersymmetry, although it is related to quantum gravity. My only supersymmetry argument will involve a BRST type of supersymmetry. On the other hand, supersymmetrizing these things that I'll be talking about is a very interesting open challenge because the symmetries of the systems I'll talk about are marginally relativistic and therefore it's far from obvious what is the best way of supersymmetrizing them. So let me begin with uh, a brief outline. The talk will be roughly divided into three parts. In the first part, I'll summarize briefly the idea of quantum gravity with anisotropic scaling. Um, I'll highlight some of the aspects which are perhaps less known. Uh, this is a subject which has now been going on for four years or so. So there's a lot of uh, mileage that can be covered, but that I'll focus only on those aspects that are primarily important for what I call Lifshitz holography or what the community calls Lifshitz holography. That's the version of ADS-CFT correspondence where the boundary field theory is actually deeply non-relativistic and exhibits Lifshitz type scaling. And uh, in part two, I will study Lifshitz holography using conventional bulk gravity coupled to matter and I'll uh, analyze some interesting features that will show us that this perspective is somewhat limited and in order to cover a bigger ground of uh, the more generic set of Lifshitz field theories in the dual description, it's actually a good idea to promote the bulk gravity from relativistic to Lifshitz as well, and we'll see how that opens up some new possibilities for, for holography. All right, so some references. The subject of Lifshitz gravity goes back uh, to the end of 2008. Those papers, there is a brief review they can find in this the most important two names and two papers for the subject of today's talk is, uh, the, are these two names. My two students, Charles has just moved on to EMU in Japan as a postdoc. Tom in, uh, is my brilliant current graduate student who will be applying for jobs at some point. And uh, the second part of the talk after the review is based on this paper which, which we had in December last year. And the third part is based on a paper which I've been saying over the past five months will appear next week, so hopefully that will at some point happen. Part one, the idea of gravity with anisotropic scaling. This is the subject that some other people refer to as Hozhava Lipschitz gravity. I usually don't use that, so you'll either hear me referring to this as gravity with anisotropic scaling or maybe Lipschitz gravity. The idea goes back to the observation that uh, we often overlap conceptually with the ideas of condensed matter physics. And uh, historically, high energy physics as well as condensed matter benefited quite often from this mutual influence. It's always a good idea if you are facing a puzzle, like uh, the many puzzles of quantum gravity, to try and see if some of the condensed matter co concepts uh, might be useful. So in this case, I'm taking the idea of splitting space and time um, apart and uh, using the conventional Wilsonian RG ideology but scaling space and time with a different power of the scaling argument. So here I'm talking about global scalings. Later on we'll be talking about promoting this into a local wild symmetry both on the field theory side or perhaps in gravity as well. For now lambda is a constant scaling factor and this coefficient little z is a very important observable known as the dynamical critical exponent in condensed matter physics where people have many, many examples of systems where z can be all kinds of interesting integers or fractions or even continuous uh, variables that change with the relevant deformations of systems. So clearly, this offers a generalization of the notion of conformal field theory to a new setting. You could also imagine refining everything even further and splitting different spatial dimensions into groups and scaling things differently. I won't do that. I'll just keep all spatial dimensions on the same footing throughout the entire talk. Uh, and the goal is to take this type of anisotropic scaling and see what we can gain if we combine this with the idea that gravity is described as a field theory using the conventional path integral language as a theory of a fluctuating metric of space-time with propagating gravitons and uh, formulated in the conventional quantum field theory setting, perhaps without requiring a UE completion with ex extra degrees of freedom. So just for completeness, 
uh, Evgeny Lifshitz was not one of my collaborators on this project. He actually died in 1985 before I entered graduate school, so I never met him. But uh, the reason why his name appears prominently in this set of theories goes back to his work from 1941 when he was actually interested in understanding some multi-critical systems, generalizing the work of uh, Landau and Lifshitz to the case where it's not just various coefficients in the potential. So let's consider the simplest example, just a single scalar field. He would reach multi-critical points by tuning various coefficients in the potential to zero and discovering higher and higher critical points. You could also tune various standard spatial kinetic terms to zero. Like here, the coefficient in front of the standard relativistic uh, spatial part of the kinetic term has been tuned to zero and uh, higher derivatives in the spatial directions here represented by the Laplace operator kick in and define for you a new fixed point. So this is a tricritical point with an isotropic scaling and z is clearly equal to two, which comes from the fact that these two terms are supposed to be on the same footing. That's the definition of the fixed point. So z has to scale, uh, time has to scale with uh, twice as uh, many powers of the scaling coefficient as, as space in order to keep these two terms on the same footing. By the way, I, I noticed that these uh, sounds from the outside are getting more and more ominous the, the further we get to the end of the conference. It reminds me of the Fellini movie, the rehearsal of the orchestra, where people are trying to constructively produce some art, or in this case, science, and then at the end there's this huge wrecking ball that comes through, and only after that there's some upheaval, and, and uh, everything comes together in a big finale, so that probably is uh, Augusto's speech at the end of the conference. Will be the Anyway, if, if I'm interrupted by the wrecking ball, you already know what the punchline is of the, of the top. So this can be an in interesting contrast between this type of theory and the relativistic scalar, where everybody remembers that much of the success of, two, of string theory has to do with the fact that in two space-time dimensions, the relativistic scalar is at its lower critical dimension, which explains a lot and actually allows you to derive Einstein's equations from the beta functions of the sigma model here, the Lifshitz type scalar, which is z equal to 2 non relativistic, is also uh, at its lower critical dimension where d is 2, but here d refers to the number of spatial dimensions. So 2 plus 1 space time dimensions are special for this system, and there's this characteristic shift in the critical dimension of the, of the scalar field when you go from z equal to 1 of the relativistic theory to z equal to 2. So we'll try to do the same with gravity again. Many of you may have heard me talk about this, so I'll be brief. I'll split the space-time metric into the spatial part. I, J are the spatial, uh, uh, spatial indices, plus the lapse function and the shift vector, which is familiar from the ADM formulation of general relativity in the first place. But my gauge symmetry will be slightly different. It consists of space-time foliation preserving the few morphisms. So as a result, you get a little more freedom in writing down generic actions that satisfy this gauge symmetry. You can in particular write down a kinetic term. This capital K is the extrinsic curvature of the leaves of constant time, but it's just a fancified time derivative of the spatial metric made covariant under the appropriate symmetries. So this kinetic term is like the time derivative of the metric squared with one interesting feature. There is this uh, new coupling constant little lambda, which is dimensionless and therefore will run generically uh, and its uh, value is not determined by any symmetry, unlike in GR, where a little lambda would be equal to 1. This, this coupling constant will be important later on for the holographic uh, applications of the theory. Plus, you get uh, pretty much free choice for what you declare to be the spatial derivative part of the action. You can build any scalar curly V to represent your potential piece in the action, as long as it's generally covariant under spatial diffeomorphisms, or more precisely under these foliation presenting diffeomorphisms. It has to be built out of the spatial Riemann tensor and the covariant derivatives. But up, uh, it's up to you to choose which terms you consider the most important. And in particular, if you are, for example, interested in a theory which would be power countering renormalizable, you may want to pick 2D derivatives um, to be uh, defining your short distance fixed point. There are two versions of the theory depending on whether 
you choose the lapse function to be a space-time dependent field or restrict n to be only a function of time. Unlike in GR, n can be restricted consistently to be only a function of time. That leads to the projectable theory. It might be a good idea to do that because n can be viewed technically as the gauge field associated with the time reparameterization invariance of time, which is not allowed to depend on space. Therefore, the gauge field itself can be consistently restricted to be a function of t only. But if you don't like this, you can just declare that n is a generic space-time field, in which case you have to go one step further and say, of course, as an effective field theorist, if uh, I have this field, if I have my symmetries, I have to allow in the action the most generic, generic set of couplings that's compatible with the symmetries. In particular, there'll be important couplings which uh, were absent in the projectable theory, which depend on the, let's say, logarithmic derivative of the lapse along spatial directions. So as long as you include these terms consistently in the action, you, you get another consistent theory. It's referred to as the non-projectable version of uh, Lipschitz gravity. And in both of these cases, by the way, case one can be viewed as a limiting case of situation number two, when you draw some, some couplings to be infinite, you restore option number one. In, all, in both cases, the spectrum generically contains one extra polarization of the graviton. In addition to your standard tensors that you get in whatever dimension you are in, you get a scalar polarization. And uh, depending on your applications that you have in mind, there are three options what you can imagine doing with the scalar. You can either live with it and explain that perhaps it modifies cosmology in interesting new ways and somehow decouples from observed matter at uh, relevant energies that we observe uh, in the tests of GR, or you can try to gap it. This is, this is actually quite uh, difficult to accomplish consistently, or you can eliminate it by an extended gauge symmetry, which is something that we actually managed to do, at least as a matter of principle. There is a worked out example where this happens, but it's tangential to what I'm talking about, so I'm not gonna discuss it uh, in this talk. The dispersion relation for both the tensors and the Scalar graviton polarizations is dominated at short distances by a deeply non-relativistic relation between frequencies and momenta, something of this sort. But of course, in the infrared, you will be deformed by relevant deformations, and uh, the dispersion relation generically will become relativistic at low energy. Uh, this happens to be a consistent dispersion relation as long as this uh, little lambda coupling constant stays away from a small, finite region of values where you would get a ghost a scalar, as long as you are somewhere on these dark parts of the real axis, both positively and negatively, you're safe and the spectrum is uh, around flat space-time in this particular case, uh, consistent and uh, perturbatively, you have a ch chance for the theory to be perturbatively unitary. <coughs> There's a special technical case. I said that generically the potential part of the action is not restricted by any symmetries besides spatial diffeomorphisms, essentially. There are special subclasses of models where, which, which kind of mimic what happened with the scalar field. But with the scalar field, it was, it was an interesting coincidence that the kinetic, sorry, the, the potential term part of the action was the square of the equations of motion of a lower dimensional relativistic action, namely the Laplace operator on phi squared, which clearly are the equations of motion squared of this action. When that happens, the theory is referred to as satisfying the detailed balance condition. This is a, techno tech a technical term borrowed from condensed matter or statistical mechanics. Some examples would be if you are in two plus one dimensions and you want your theory to satisfy detailed balance, then the potential piece has to be zero because there is no non-trivial action available whose equation of motion would give you some non-trivial potential. Uh, in three dimensions, there's another interesting case where if you take the Chern-Simons action, vary that, it gives you the detailed balance action um, in three plus one dimensions, which is the square of the cotton tensor. And uh, this condition sounds kind of obscure and who knows where it comes from, but it will make a, su uh, a surprisingly prominent appearance in the holographic renormalization picture that I'll talk about hopefully in a couple of minutes. I al already mentioned that uh, the UV fixed point generically experiences some uh, flow due to relevant deformations. In the case of the scalar field, the example gives you a flow under the influence of two relevant terms, 
One of them produces an effective speed of light, so for the low-energy observer who can only access this single scalar field, the, the theory will look accidentally relativistic. Of course, if you have more than one scalars, this would generically not be true because different species would see this different speeds of light. But for this particular case, this is an interesting pattern. The effective speed of light comes from the relevant term uh, in the analysis of operators available around the UA fixed point, and so does the mass term, of course. So again, this confirms that this is a generic way of constructing multi-critical points, just like Lifshitz intended in the 1940s. In the case of gravity, generically you'll be dominated in the infrared by the two most important terms, and that happen to be the same ones that you get in the ADM decomposition of GR, which is the scalar curvature spatially plus a cosmological constant term. So you flow in pure gravity to is equal to one scaling for sure, and uh, whether or not you approximate well general relativity is a separate question. I mentioned that uh, these anisotropic conformal transformations, which are so important here, can be consistently promoted to wild transformations, and that will be important because I'll be attempting to study wild anomalies in these non-relativistic field theories uh, of the Lifshitz type. So I can introduce a scaling factor. Later on, we'll be talking about infinitesimal uh, Lie algebra value omega here of uh, infinitesimal and isotropic wild transformations. Um, the important thing here is that this scaling factor doesn't rescale all the components of the metric the same way. It rescales the spatial metric in a certain way. It rescales the shift vector in the same way. This is required by self-consistency, as it turns out. But then you are not restricted to rescale n by anything specific. You can pick your value of z, and then you can prove that this anisotropic wall symmetry associated with that fixed value of z is self-consistently combined with the foliation-preserving diffeomorphisms. So this allows you to introduce anisotropic wall transformations consistently with the diffeomorphism structure on the foliated manifold. And this will be important at least in two different places. Uh, it will be important because we'll be studying those wild anomalies under these local anisotropic conformal transformations. But also, it will be important even if you don't believe in Lipschitz gravity and say, I like Lipschitz holography, I want to use relativistic GR in the bulk to study things that are asymptotically Lipschitz near the boundary. Turns out if you use um, Penrose's definition of conformal infinity, you get nonsense, and you have to stop there. You cannot run the usual holographic procedure of ADS-CFT. Uh, as an alternative, we actually used these anisotropic wall transformations with values of z not equal to 1 to generalize Penrose's definition of conformal infinity. And uh, that leads to anisotropic conformal infinity, which is reproducing your expectations for holography. So those are at least two different ways in which this is relevant. OK, so now imagine that you are starting with a non-gravitational conformal field theory, but it's not conformal under relativistic conformal symmetries. Instead, it's uh, scale invariant under the um, conformal anisotropic scalings with a fixed exponent z not equal to 1. As an example, you can imagine 2 plus 1 dimensions and big z equal to 2. That's a particularly interesting case, which I'll be focusing on in a few minutes. Uh, although we've performed the calculations, um, the first paper that we published has appendices which are longer than the body of the paper, and then they contain calculations for generic values of z and d for the holographic normalization. So just like in relativistic field theory, you know how important it is to classify wild anomalies. And we know that already in two dimensions there is one beautiful invariant. Uh, if you look at the response of the effective action for your field theory, to the presence of the gravitational background. You know that there is a scalar curvature term that can show up here, and the coefficient of that will be then a very important invariant of your field theory, nam namely the central charge. And uh, of course, we know how to generalize this in principle to dimensions uh, 2n for any integer n. In four dimensions, you would get two central charges, famously the a and c, uh, and so on. So the story generalizes. Here, we want to study the same question for non-relativistic uh, Lifshitz type field theories. Strangely enough, I was assuming this, was, this must have been done years and years ago by condensed matter people. They never touched this, this problem. So this is, this is something we had to do from scratch. And uh, as an example, let's focus on, on that simplest situation of two plus one dimensions. 
This is interesting. Two plus one dimensions, of course, in relativistic cases will lead to no wild anomalies, as in any other odd dimension. But in two plus one dimensions, when z is equal to two, you can actually, and this is where my only supersymmetry argument comes in, we set up the BRSD cohomology calculation for identifying the spectrum of all possible anomaly terms that can show up. And when the dust settles, we find that there are two invariants that can show up as an anomaly. Uh, there was a competing group, uh, Jan de Boer and his collaborators published their papers, I think three or four days after ours. They claimed that there were three central charges. The third one, unfortunately, doesn't satisfy the West Zumino consistency condition. So it's really not a BRSD cohomology. So we stand behind our result. There are two available central charges. One of them happens to take precisely the form of the kinetic term of conformal Lipschitz gravity. So it's independent of spatial derivatives of the metric. And the other one is, on the other hand, completely independent of time derivatives of the metric. Roughly speaking, it's just the spatial scalar curvature R of the two dimension slices squared, again, fancified by these independent um, things that make everything uh, covariant under foliation preserving diffeomorphisms. But in, intuitively, you can think of this as R squared, essentially. And each of these coefficients represents an arbitrary, a priori arbitrary central charge. So you can. Sorry? This is the lapse function. And only the lapse. The shift vector only appears inside these extrinsic curvatures. Sorry? Sorry, I, I'm not hearing the question. R squared. R, and the whole thing is squared. Yes, so I'm saying this is, you should think of it intuitively, uh, intuitively as just R squared, except it's, it's fancified by this extra gradient of n terms that are there just to make things covariant. But morally, this is like the closest approximation to what R squared can be. All right, so these two central charges can, can appear. I haven't shown you any field theories. As usual with anomalies, if you do the BRST ana analysis, you find out which invariants can appear, but that doesn't mean that they are realized by field theories. So that's an open question until a few transparencies from now. All right, so I mentioned that these two anomaly terms happen to be actually things that you find if you try to construct what I would call conformal Lipschitz gravity or conformal gravity at a Lipschitz point. So more specifically, this is precisely what you would expect conformal gravity at a Lipschitz point to be if you know what conformal gravity in the relativistic case is. So it's just an, a generalization where you have classically, you impose also while local symmetries with your fixed preferred value of z. Of course, if you are in d plus one dimensions, a particular natural choice is to set z equal to d, in which case you have a theory which will have only up to time, two time derivatives. Uh, but there are other versions depending on, again, your preferred values of z. And uh, it turns out if you impose this generalized symmetry, um, the kinetic term, of course, will now lock the value of little lambda to be one over d. And that's what happened on the previous transparency where d was two, so we had one over two uh, in the anomaly. It's auto automatically a non-projectable theory because the wild transformations, since they are space-time dependent and they act on the lapse function, the lapse has to be a space-time dependent field. So that explains why from now on, I'll be only considering the more general non-projectable version of the theory. And uh, that's, I guess, all I wanted to mention right now about this. So this finally is my summary of Lipschitz gravity. Uh, and since the rest will be based on known features of ADS-CFT, hopefully that will uh, allow me to go faster without spending too much time on details. So these aspects of Lipschitz gravity you can imagine using in various areas of physics. You can say maybe this is an interesting alternative for phenomenology of gravity in our universe. That's not what I'm going to talk about. You can also say, perhaps this is the analytic uh, part of what people have been doing on the lattice, namely the CDT approach might be just the lattice version of Lipschitz gravity. There seems to be more and more evidence for that. Again, that's something I'm not going to talk about. You could talk about math applications, but the only thing I want, I want to discuss today is the ADS-CFT applications.
All right, so Lifshitz holography. This is a completely different way in which the word Lifshitz comes in into physics. And uh, it started essentially in 2008, even though we had that metric with my student Charles in 2007, we weren't bold enough to publish it uh, because we were looking for a theory of gravity which has that Lifshitz metric as a solution in the vacuum. Uh, Shamid and company published this metric which uh, reproduces geometrically the expected scaling of Lifshitz type field theories and claimed it to be a solution of Einstein gravity plus some extra matter, which of course you can always do with any metric. But long story short, it's just a non-relativistic version of what uh, ADS-CFT correspondence does for relativistic field theories. Here you want to put a non-relativistic theory on the boundary and uh, again interpret the radial direction as being associated with the scaling of uh, the RG picture and uh, you then ask what happens if I put various gravity theories in the bulk, what kind of field theories in the boundary can I access? So as I said, Shamit and company started by saying this Lifshitz type metric with a fixed value of z not equal to one, which I need for the gravitational description of holographic duals of non relativistic field theories, is by definition a solution of Einstein gravity coupled with sufficiently crazy stuff so that this is a solution. Part B would be to say, modify gravity in such a way you don't have to add any matter, it will be ground. In both cases, the story is interesting. be a solution. And there are even some stringy embeddings, more or less, in the literature. So then you, as I mentioned earlier, realize that the conformal infinity of Penrose doesn't work, doesn't reproduce for you even a co-dimension one boundary of space-time, which is like the starting point for running something like the pfefferman gram expansion and running holography. So you have to modify conformal infinity, which we did with Charles in 2009. And then you find out that everything works nicely and gives you a hint how to perform the holographic renormalization. The holographic renormalization famously, of course, is a relation between the bulk calculation in gravity and uh, the correlation function or generating functional of, co of correlation functions in the dual field theory. I'm assuming that this formula holds in the non-relativistic holography as well. And just as in the relativistic case, I'll focus on the simplest, most interesting starting point, namely classical limit on the gravity side. So I'll be taking only the low energy effective action on, on the gravity side. And the entire effective action on the field theory side will be evaluated by taking care of uh, defining the on-shell action on the gravity side in the bulk. Of course, this makes no sense until you regularize and perform renormalization. I'm assuming that people are familiar with this, but just as a summary, you cut off the boundary at infinity, put it at some finite distance, one over epsilon away from infinity. And uh, the reason for doing that is that what is the ultraviolet divergence in the effective field theory action is an, is an infrared divergence on the gravity side because of the infinite volume of space time. So here you are evaluating all of this complicated stuff from field theory simply by evaluating an onshell action for gravity but on an infinite space, and all the regularization has to do with cutting that off and properly taking care of counterterms that appear. There is by now a well-established well technical procedure that goes under, well, it's basically the Hamilton-Jacobi theory where you consider the radial direction as your evolution parameter, and you remember that um, calculating the effective action on shell is equivalent to solving essentially the Hamilton-Jacobi equation in that radial direction. So in the relativistic case, this type of calculation was set up uh, a long time ago by various people named here. And you can see that when you apply it, 
what generically happens, the most interesting case is the case where you don't get just uh, power divergences, but you also get a log divergence. This doesn't happen necessarily in all dimensions. In the case of relativistic holography, this would happen in the case where the boundary theory is even dimensional. And you can then trace the logic of the arguments and identify this coefficient L tilde, this counter term here, as precisely the wild anomaly of that dual field theory. This is a very important invariant that you want to study. But the way you derive it, you plug this ansatz for the divergences back into the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, and you find out that there is a recursive relation that connects all these counter terms to each other through the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So again, bottom line is that the while anomaly for your dual field theory can be derived directly from these infrared counter terms on the gravity side, when you know how these different counter terms are related to each other, you can count orders and calculate these order by order, determine the anomaly in the end. So let's see what happens. When we do this in the simplest non-relativistic example, so this is where, uh, again, we go back to our first paper from November. We did this for generic Z and D, but the most interesting case is Z equal to 2, D equal to 2, the first non-trivial example. And indeed, we found a quartic counterterm, a quadratic counterterm, and a wild anomaly for the Z equal to 2 and isotropic wild symmetries. And note that this wild anomaly takes a very special form. It only contains the kinetic central charge, while the other central charge miraculously vanishes. And we were very puzzled about that, because why should it be zero? This is a relation which is somewhat similar to the fact that A equals C in relativistic holography in the gravitational approximation. You have to work hard and throw in higher derivative terms or some other fancy features in order to free that those two central charges from each other. So it seemed like something like that was happening here. And we were at first puzzled. But then it turned out, let's see, there are several interesting things. First of all, conceptually, what does it mean that only this term shows up and the other one is 0? It can be translated into saying the anomaly satisfies the detail balance condition. If you go back to how I defined detail balance, it turns out that the R squared type anomaly is precisely an object that does not satisfy the detail balance condition. And this guy is actually, in some sense, some very precise mathematical sense, satisfying the detail balance condition. So why should the, the anomaly satisfy the detail balance condition? Well, we first tried to probe that same structure by throwing in a bunch of other scalars and seeing if, if the same features of the anomaly persist. So with bulk scalars, the anomaly calculation is much more complicated, but what comes out, strangely enough, is exactly the structure of conformal Lipschitz gravity coupled to conformal matter that I had in my first paper on Lipschitz gravity in 2008. So this action was not postulated in this context. It was calculated from the holographic normalization in the bulk, when the bulk theory was the relativistic uh, theory uh, due to uh, Marika Taylor. And this exact action came out, and it does satisfy, again, the detail balance condition. So this was very confusing and strange. Uh, then we also asked, do we have any field theory examples which do or do not satisfy the detail balance condition when you look at the anomaly? So the simplest example, which was actually calculated in that paper by De Boer four days after us, uh, they actually calculated the anomaly for free scalars coupled to the gravitational background. And they found out that, again, the anomaly satisfied the detail balance condition. It's not very surprising because the scalar itself in the flat background satisfies the detail balance. So its anomaly coincidentally also satisfies the detail balance condition. In other words, the second available central charge automatically vanishes. So first of all, we then understood why this detail balance condition comes out. After all, it's such an arcane condition. Where would it possibly come from? It actually comes precisely from the recursive relation among the counter terms. It turns out that the wild anomaly counter term is not just sitting there. It's related to the equation of motion that you get if you take the quadratic counter term as an effective action and square those equations of motion. This is precisely that part of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation that relates these two counter terms recursively to each other. So this explains why the anomaly had to satisfy detail balance. 
as long as the hamilton jacobi equation of the relativistic theory in the bulk is in place. There is some tangential story. Let me skip that since I have less time than required for that. And then we started being curious about field theories which have the second central charge, which does not satisfy detail balance, also non-zero. Now, the first, first thought is that maybe bulk holography with the relativistic theory is smart enough that it knows that no consistent non-relativistic field theories perhaps would be able to have this non-zero uh, R-squared type anomaly. But then if you ask the right student, they think for about five minutes and they come up with a beautiful example of a free, non-minimally non coupled uh, scalar field theory, which actually has a generic anomaly. So this is a field theory, again, of a free scalar phi coupled to the background gravity but now in a non-minimal way, somewhat reminiscent of what happens when you take the linear Dilaton CFT in two dimensions. You can, of course, shift famously the central charge by coupling non-minimally to the scalar curvature, and that gives you a freedom of dialing away from C equal to one. You can now reach any positive value of C um, by dialing the coefficient of that non-minimal coupling. So here it's very similar, except now the non-minimal, the correct structure of the non-minimal coupling takes phi squared and couples it essentially to this R squared type anomaly coefficient. This you can check is consistent with the conformal symmetry and can have an arbitrary coupling gamma in front. So now you can actually calculate the anomaly for this system and show that there are two independent terms. Both of them are non-zero. In particular, the one that does not satisfy data balance can be dialed arbitrarily by tuning this value gamma to whatever you like. So now we know that there are consistent, this is a perfectly well-defined theory. It's a Gaussian theory. It's exactly solvable in arbitrary backgrounds. It's a unitary theory, nothing wrong with it. So we have examples of CFDs with z equal to two in which both central charges are non-zero. So how do you access holographic duals for this much richer structure of field theories if you, ca you can now allow both central charges to be non-zero and the relativistic theory is not able to do that? Why is it impossible to do it in that relativistic system that I started with? It was precisely because of that recursive uh, relation that followed from the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. It always takes the form of detailed balance condition and you have to move away from this to get more general systems which have the central the second central charge non-zero as well. So that's why we turn finally to the obvious choice because I've always thought if you are interested in non-relativistic field theories in the boundary, who is forcing you to have the bulk theory always Einstein plus other relativistic stuff? Why don't we allow non-relativistic versions of gravity to play the role of holographic duals? After all, there is no reason to constrain the bulk gravity system by some tests of gravity because we are not directly accessing any, any of those holographic duals. So as I said, it requires the non-projectable theory. And uh, so we'll now start with Lifshitz gravity in the bulk. We will not put in any extra matter. So that makes this, I think, the most minimalistic setting for Lifshitz holography. And I'll focus, just like in the case of GR, only on the low energy limit in uh, the bulk. So I'll be looking at the z equal to one low energy limit of Lifshitz gravity in the bulk. I will not discuss whether this is UV complete because of the gravity itself or whether this requires some string embedding. This is irrelevant for me, just like for effective holography in the conventional setting where people use just low energy effective gravity action. So what is my low energy effective action now compared to GR? There are two differences that are here in yellow. It's this coupling constant lambda which is new. And also in the non-projectable uh, theory, as I said, there are these spatial gradients of the lapse function. Uh, and there is a term which is of the same order of importance as the leading Einstein-like terms. And that's precisely the gradient squared um, with a, an arbitrary coupling alpha squared. This, uh, this coupling alpha squared was discussed already prior to this in the literature on Lifshitz gravity by people like uh, uh, Blas, Pujolas, and Sibiryakov, and they found interesting constraints, bounds on what are the consistent values of alpha. This will come back in a second. So what I claim, again, long story short, since I only have four and a half minutes left, the idea is that compared to GR, 
we now have two additional coupling constants, lambda and alpha, in the low energy limit. And that's actually precisely what you need to get. First of all, the Lifshitz space time with their favorite value of z as a ground state solution that basically eats up one of these two couplings. And then you'll not be surprised, since otherwise I probably wouldn't talk about this, that the other free coupling gets traded precisely for that new spatial part of the anomaly. So that's, that's how it works. More precisely, if you want to see formulas, if you dial your cosmological constant to be equal to this, and then if you set alpha squared equal to this thing, then the Lifshitz space-time with z equal to this z here is a solution. And it also leads to a very interesting reconstruction of the bound found originally on phenomenological grounds by these people. They argue that alpha square has to be less than or equal to two. That's exactly the accumulation point if you try to push z all the way to infinity. You start approaching two from below. So this is all nicely so consistent. You can actually study, interestingly enough, a, a new uh, generalization of the uh, BF bound known from the relativistic setting. Here it actually frees up some new, just like in the relativistic setting, you can now have uh, massive scalars whose mass squared might be slightly negative depending on your value of, of the cosmological constant. Here, what happens is somewhat uh, interestingly parallel to that, namely the values of little lambda that are allowed by the unitarity bound are now slightly inside that forbidden region that I mentioned earlier. The forbidden region between one over D and one came from requiring a consistent spectrum around flat space time. Now we are around the Lifshitz space time and it's actually the reality of the scaling dimensions of the dual operators that tell us what the new bound is and it's slightly less restrictive just like in the BF case uh, of the relativistic theory. So that's just a kind of cute aside remark. So long story short, I could show you formulas but hopefully they'll appear within that proverbial week in that paper that I've been promising for five months. And uh, the story is very uh, parallel to the relativistic uh, bulk situation. You set up the corresponding hamilton jacobi equation. It's, a, uh, it's an algorithmic procedure. The same logic for deriving counterterms applies. And you find out that if once the theory in the bulk is Lifshitz gravity, you avoid, interestingly, the, there's still a recursive relation, of course, between counterterms, but it gets modified in a way which avoids imposing the uh, detailed balance condition. So you can now calculate the center charges, and you see that there is a two-parameter family where you can actually have arbitrary consistent values of both of these center charges for the field theory. So uh, one of my conclusions would be that based on this example, we believe that the Lifshitz gravity bulk theory is a natural starting point for doing Lifshitz holography, there shouldn't be this artificial, artificial separation between being interested in gravity duals for Lifshitz theories uh, and uh, actually using Lifshitz gravity for the description of those systems. And the conclusions are basically summarized now, so you can read the rest, but I think I should stop here. Thank you. <laughs> We are a bit late, so maybe we have time for one or two questions. It's not my fault. No. It was the previous speaker. I have two points that I wanted to, to raise. Sure. When the ADS uh, CFT correspondence started, uh, it was essentially driven by symmetry. Somehow you knew that uh, the symmetries of a certain ADS space were coinciding with the symmetries, the conformal symmetry of the boundary Minkowski space, mm -hmm. and therefore there was this theory which was conformal invariance and so on and so forth. And then a lot of decorations came up, uh, like the non-relativistic analog. Sure. What kind of symmetry uh, do we, I mean, uh, in, other, in other words, this kind of strong protection argument, that at least at that point is present, uh, in my opinion, is not supposed somehow to protect this more general case. I'm not only Absolutely. referring about the, the Lifshitz uh, gravity case, but also these more general applications. Is it clear? I mean, that. Uh, well, it, it's an absolutely valid point. I, I agree 100%. I think it's just the, um, the amount of uh, evidence that we've accumulated or the community has accumulated over the past 15 years now since the original idea CFT conjecture. 
which already in the relativistic setting seems to point in the direction of many things actually being extendable beyond large degrees of supersymmetry. And the more you believe that the correspondence, some form of the correspondence is there or can even be perhaps used as a way of defining the other side of the duality, then you acquire more confidence and try to apply it at least as a, as a tentative conjecture. So I would say this is a, a conjecture of the same order of uh, precision as the original supersymmetric idea CFT, of course. This is a much weaker conjecture, uh, which would need to be subject, subjected to tests. Tests are difficult here for several reasons. Not only the lack of supersymmetry, actually the question how to supersymmetrize this independently of any applications to see, uh, to conform, uh, conform of your theory in Kona's matter, that question would be very interesting conceptually because supersymmetry in non-relativistic settings is much more intricate and there are several different options what you might consider to be the right way of supersymmetrizing, supersymmetrizing things because you no longer can rely on some uniqueness of super, super Poincaré structure. So not only that, but also there is a, um, an almost shameful lack of examples in the condensed matter, matter literature. If you ask condensed matter friends, give me a list of conformal field theories that you can solve or you at least have a perturbative handle on, the story stops very, very early. All these calculations we have to do with our own examples because none of this has been studied in condensed matter. You would think that they would be interested in these types of things, but they've never really classified anything. So. There are very few examples, and of course, if you are really interested in strongly interacting, perhaps large n-type theories that would be <coughs> the ones that would be most directly related to these gravitational calculations and low energies in the bulk, there is essentially nothing in, in the condensed metal So that's an, that's an obstacle against actually testing this. So we would say, let's look at the most robust uh, invariants like the Wall anomaly. So we calculate the anomaly, we show that there are consistent field theories where both anomalies are non-zero. And that seems a sufficiently robust question. How do you reconstruct both anomalies consistently in the bulk? Is, it, is the relativistic theory sufficient or do you have to move to something more exotic? Given the fact that we know at least for free field theories, there are examples where both anomalies are non-zero. But we don't have any examples of strongly interacting field theories at large n which would have that same type of anomaly, simply because nobody looked into this uh, in the condensed matter literature. I think we can thank the speaker again. Stop here.